So today um, we come into our first Sunday in Advent, and and the Advent wreath for me has always been exciting. Just the idea of lighting of the candles, and there's something about when you light those candles. Maybe if it's something that you do at home, or even if, even if it's just something you do here, when that light goes on, and that that brightness comes on, especially if the lights are dim, there's something special about that, isn't there? You know, that light of that first candle, hope, peace, joy. I never forget the joy, though, because that pink color, it's different, you know? That joy, that excitement, the anticipation, and all coming into love, and then Jesus coming, right? The Advent wreath, the Advent calendar, maybe you had those chocolate peel-away ones as a kid, where it all builds the excitement leading to something, leading into something for us. This is the season of Advent. So I want you to consider this. The kids this morning in the kids' message, they had to wait. They talked about waiting, and they had to wait to get their prize. And they did a great job of waiting, but imagine if we wait, made them wait a day or two or a month. It would be harder, wouldn't it? To sit here on the steps for a couple of days? No, they wouldn't do that. We get anxious when we have to wait. But there's different kinds of waiting. For, for me, there's like waiting going to the doctor. I'm sorry, for any dentist, I love dentists. I have a lot of friends who are dentists. Um, but, but it's often the kind of thing where sometimes people don't want to wait to go to the doctor. They have anxiety over it. Maybe even your blood pressure raises while you're waiting to get checked out. Or, or you have a fear over going in to have your teeth worked on. What are they going to find? It's probably not going to be something good. I mean, maybe you have a good checkup. So we have an anxiety over waiting. There's a fear over waiting. But there's a different kind of waiting. And that's the kind of waiting that we're talking about today, that Jesus is talking about. But I want you to understand the gospel text that you heard read this morning a lot of times people focus on these end times. They hear that theme and that becomes their focus. But Jesus tells the story. He even tells a parable right in the middle of it. A parable about a fig tree. The waiting that Jesus is talking about, the anticipation is one more like we have when we wait for something that we're looking forward to. Can you think of a time when you anticipated in your waiting something great, when you were so excited for the day to come? I mean, obviously Christmas time, that's our season two we're coming into. Kids get so excited, don't they? But so do parents. They get so excited about the gathering, the food, the family, the presents. And maybe you can relate to that, the, the anticipation of waiting for something that you were just couldn't, you could wait no longer for, that you're so excited about. This is the kind of waiting that Jesus is talking about. And the focus of the gospel is on waiting with expectation that Jesus will fulfill his promise, that he will stand with us. So there's so much to unpack in this text, and I'm just going to hit on a few things. As we read this text, as we heard it this morning, in verse 29, it said, Jesus told them a parable. That's a story, you know. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. He referred the fig tree, or any tree, so that nobody would be left out, right? You may not have a fig tree in your backyard, but you have some kind of tree around you. You know that in a certain time of year, when the life begins to sprout again, in the fig tree or any tree, you see the leaves budding out of the tree. It's a sign of something to come, isn't it? And I imagine that you get excited about that. Seeing the growth, the life, spring's coming, summer's coming. Jesus takes this as an example, and he says that the kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of God is coming near to you. The same way that you see uh, the fig tree producing a leaf, 
The kingdom of God is also near. We see signs of that as well. So you and I see that every time we come into the church, every time we see this baptismal font, we're reminded in the sacrament of what Jesus has done for us. Every time we receive the Lord's Supper, we're reminded that the kingdom of heaven has come to us. Every time we hear the word read to us and we hear an absolution of sins, a forgiveness of sins, the kingdom of heaven has come to you in the person of Jesus. In the same way you see signs of spring coming or end times coming, you see tangible signs of the kingdom of God coming into the world, coming to you. And and that takes precedence over everything. So Jesus is trying to correlate these two things, you know. As you see a tree growing, he's saying, remember, the kingdom of heaven has come and is coming to you. He's connecting these things together for us. The text goes on and it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus reminds us in this parable, this story, and then his, his words around it, he reminds us of the power of the word of God, how it will endure. It is the only thing in this world that endures. Only worldly thing is his word. That's how powerful it is. His, his word is a light. So when we light these, these candles here today, It reminds us how how his word is like that as well, a light for our path. Now, I hear I hear people oftentimes they'll say, God, I'm, I'm waiting on you. God, where are you? Maybe that's you. Maybe some of you are in that place. God, I'm waiting on you. Will you show up for me? Will you answer me? So many people feel that expression. And and so Jesus is telling us today, do you see it? Do you hear it? He's saying that his word has power. He's saying, Jesus is saying that he's answering you in his tangible word that is written for you. Where you can see and hear and know him through his word. You can know him through the sacraments. He's coming to you. So when we feel that way, he's saying, open my word. I'm right here for you. But sometimes that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Honestly, there's so many distractions that keep us from coming into his word where he says he's going to be for you. This, I love this picture. This is one of my favorite pictures of the word shining on a, on a path, lighting a path. Just a simple picture of an everyday person using the Bible to light the way in the darkness. I like this picture, and every time I see it, I think about, I think about my friends who have been caught up in addiction, who've been caught up in substance addiction, who, who recognize, and the thing that I really, really love about people who are in uh, addiction recovery is that they fully acknowledge that they completely, absolutely need help. That they need Jesus. This is what I love about people in addiction recovery is they know how much they need Jesus. Do you know how much you need Jesus? Isn't it easy sometimes to rely upon ourselves, to look only to self and not trust or need even think that we need a path that leads us somewhere? But this picture really summarizes it. Jesus is saying, my word is the light unto your path. He wants us to trust in him. He will light the way for us. But it's hard because rather than being addicted to Jesus, we're addicted to all the things in this world. And it numbs our minds and it changes our steps and it turns our hearts and it hardens us and it makes us angry and bitter. But Jesus says, I have a better way. I want to shine the path clear for you. I'm here for you. You know, Jesus, when he talks about him in, himself in the Bible, and when the, the Bible expresses words, it often uses this expression of light. Why do you think Jesus uses this idea of light so often? When you think about it, the light that shines in the darkness, darkness can't overcome it. 
light brings us comfort, doesn't us? Like maybe you even have a nightlight for your kids. It brings us comfort when we feel alone. And so Jesus refers to himself so many times. I'm going to share with you just a couple of examples where we see in, in the book of John uh, 1.4, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. He is light for you and for me. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. This is speaking about Jesus' life. Jesus is the true life, which brings light to everyone and to the world from John 1.9. We see in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, Jesus says about himself in John 9, 5. Those are just only but a mere few examples of Jesus referring to himself as the light. He uses this example of himself because... We're afraid of the dark. We're afraid of the unknown. Or what tomorrow might bring. But Jesus uses the example of light because in light we find comfort, we find peace, we find security. It would be scary to walk down this dark tunnel without lights, wouldn't it? Maybe if you're in the subway or somewhere else in the city. That light does everything. And so Jesus, not me, but Jesus uses the example of light so that you can know just like the light in that subway, in that tunnel, gives you security. It it uncovers, unmasks the unknowns in your life. So too does the word of God give you light to your path. So why do we struggle to read it? Why do we struggle to come into it? All the distractions of the world are like that darkness, and Jesus wants to light it up for you. I wanted to share with you the story. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie called The Finest Hour. It's a really fantastic movie about uh, this, this Coast Guard, 1952. It's their greatest rescue in all of documented history in the Coast Guard, where they saved 32 individuals who were on a boat out in the middle of this massive storm, 1952. And these four uh, guardsmen went out on their small boat to to attempt a rescue in the middle of the storm where the waves were 40, 50, 60 feet high. And so they thought there was no hope in them actually even returning. But in the midst of huge, massive waves and the boats tipping over and riding itself, they made it through. They found the boat. They lost all of their communications. Their windows were smashed out. Uh, They lost all of their lights, but somehow or another, they found this boat and 32 men were able to, almost swamping this small boat, they were able to bring them back to rescue. So maybe you've seen that movie, but as they were freezing cold from the water coming through the storm, they're trying to find their way back to the harbor. And in the movie, the movie showed how cars pulled up on the dock and turned on their lights so that they could see, they could find their way back. But in reality, in real life, not just in the Hollywood movie, um, what they recounted is that they were able to find their way back by a little red light on a buoy. They saw that buoy, that red light, and they knew they were close to home. They were close to the harbor. And then pretty soon, they, sh- they saw the lighthouse that shone in the darkness. And, <clears throat> and those two lights guided them back to safety this amazing rescue story. And I think, I think about it like that, that Jesus refers to himself so often as the light because he is that rescue story for you. He is that light in whatever darkness you face, whatever trouble you think is too great for yourself because it is. But it's not for him. He shines the light to guide us home. He shines his light through his word because he wants to lighten your path. He wants you to know of his presence. And so here's what the text kind of towards the end. It says, watch yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. And and this, this notion, again, this dissipation, I was really fixated on this word dissipation. And, and really this idea of dissipation is it's like, uh, it's like uh, 
a slow, progressive loss of something good. Slowly how we turn our lives more and more to worldly things. We become sedentary. We focus on worldly things and we're weighed down. And I almost picture it when our hearts are weighed down. It's almost like your head, you know, kind of droops. And if you, if you think with me for a minute as we're weighed down with just the busyness of life, just general life things, our worries, the future, and our heads kind of down, what are we looking at? Theologically, we talk about it, how sometimes we stare at our navel. We stare inward. The more downcast, the more dissipated, the more sedentary we, we become with life things, the more we turn inward the more we focus on self. And so this is what Jesus wants to change our whole mindset about. At the start of the text, it says, now when these things begin to take place, and these things you know, are scary things and big things and world-shaking things which can produce fear in us, and certainly when we watch them on the news, we're afraid of tomorrow and the future. But Jesus says, when these things take place, whatever storm you're in, no matter how dark it seems, straighten up, raise your heads. The worries of life turn us inward. The dissipation turns us in on ourselves. But Jesus lifts our heads up. It's like that light that shines, that rescue that has come to each one of you, that redemption that now draws near because of Jesus for each one of you. So here's how the text concludes. It says, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. When we hear this text, our focus can be on the scary things and the end things and the world shaking things. And that's our nature turned in on self. But the focus that Jesus is pointing out for us the growth, the light, the presence of His Word, the power of His Word, His tangible presence in your life, His light for you. The focus for us is that last part of the sentence. Stand before the Son of Man. You get to stand before Jesus. You get to be in His presence because He's come to rescue you. When you were alone, like those guys were on that boat, when you were all alone, when you were focused on self, when you were turned inwards, when you were caught up in anything in life, when you were in the dark places, Jesus has come to you. I want to encourage you because he says his word is like a lamp that lights our step and it encourages us. You know, our, our psalm reading today, the girls did such a good job of reading Psalm 80. Fantastic. That filled my heart with joy to see that young ones reading. So thank you, Eva, for letting them read today. What a real honor that was. I want to encourage you, if, if they can read Psalm 80 for us, our psalm reading today is Psalm 25. To push back against that darkness and dissipation and discouragement and worldly things, you know how you can rebel against those? You can turn into God's word where he says it's light. I want to encourage you to read Psalm 25 today. As you go home, as you go about your day, Turn into the Word, open up the light, read Psalm 25, our psalm reading for today, and hear about this light and presence of Jesus for you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you are the light that has come into the world. And however much the world shakes, your Word endures to eternal life. Encourage our hearts today with your presence, with your light in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.